Uh, hi guys, today I'm doing a very rare thing, which is a Sad Truth show in person. I've got Tommy Robinson with me from Britain, the British Honey Badger. How are you doing, Tommy? I'm good, Scott. So good to see you. Uh, Tommy, for those of you who don't know, has more courage than a random sample of 10,000 men in the West that you could pick up. That's true. And probably more testosterone than 10,000 men. And we know that to be true because we've done measures of testosterone in men and it has gone precipitously down. He's the only guy who's keeping us alive, guys. Uh, all right, Tommy, uh, I saw you, or not, well, I saw you remotely. We did a show eight years ago. You were as handsome, but I was much fatter. Uh, oh. I looked at it this morning. Uh, yeah, that's I right. Morning. You, you sent me a screenshot of that where you said men do age, age like fine wine. Like wine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's stop. We could talk about many serious things, but none as, as serious as soccer or as we probably should call it football. football. And uh, you're English, so you support the English team. Apparently, I heard, cover your ears if you don't want to hear. England is losing to Denmark. No, I just checked literally as we just sat down. I and just checked this one on. One oh, okay. Oh, it's a two one. That was the last game. It's Very good. Up. So, uh, are you thinking that this is the year that they're going to finally win it? I go and watch England. Yeah, I used. I've always went and watched them, and then I fell out of love a bit with them when uh, the Black Lives Matter thing happened and they got on their knees. It really, do you know, I, I just and the politicisation, the rainbow bands. I just think keep politics out of football. There's a reason people go to football. Just get away from all that. All right. Keep it. It's just a sport. So it frustrated me. I fell out of love and I found it hard to get behind them again. I just uh, the more wokeness that I saw being introduced into our international football game. You know our football. You know, you know our football kit this season. Do you know the flag on the back? Yeah. It's the it's the transgender colours. Oh, is that right? Oh, like the, the, the English, super colour one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flag, no, the English flag. The English flag so is the transgender Georgia's flag. They've added the transgender logo onto our flag. Nice. Onto our flag. So whilst we sat, and the reason I said because I, I, I'd asked you to do this podcast, and I looked at the timing, and I thought it's the same time as the England match. I thought Gad Sad doesn't take the knee, so I'm going to go sit down. With Gadsad. I am with honoured that I that I came ahead of the English national ahead team. Of the English now, uh, different players that are good, but probably now the one that most people are talking about is Bellingham. Do you think he's as big as they make him out to be? Again, I just do you know with my football, I love Luton Town, which is my club. Yeah. Yeah. My apologies for the relegation. Yeah, but the fact we got there anyway was un unbelievable. True. And do you know, the fact we got there anyway, do you know, I've, I've been on a four-year ban from going to football, yeah? I was banned. Was that true? From attending football, yeah? I was banned from As attending. what? Because you're a hooligan? They tried multiple, so originally I was going to France for the Euros, I was, I was travelling to France for the Euros, and I thought, do you know what, I think they were trying to stop me. So I was in a motorhome, so I got under the bed, yeah? And, and as we went through Calais, I didn't show my passport. And I got to France, and then my wife rang me up and said, police are all over the house, they've just raided the house looking for you. I said, what are they looking for me for? They said, to stop you going to France, yeah? So I made a video saying, I'm in France, and I, I, I added Bedfordshire, please, I'm dancing, yeah? But then when I come back from the football, I've been there three weeks, when I come back, I was back the, the next morning, bang, the police come round, and they took me straight to court. And their reason was that my presence in France, which has a high Muslim population, could provoke a reaction. Oh, my presence right. and then they give me maps so when I went to court I fought it and the map where they wanted to ban me from every Saturday included the entire Muslim community of Luton yeah? so it was a control order that they were using football legislation because down to football legislation they brought in laws to deal with hooliganism that if they believe you're a risk they can then put you on these bans but they only have a time period to do it so whenever there's a football tournament like there is now so if I went to the airport now to fly to the country where the football is they can invoke this legislation that gives them the ability to give you perimeter bans of towns and cities yeah, to deal with football violence. Who, 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 who's controlling the, the Tommy Robinson problem? Like so it's the government. So this is the, the home office. So it's not the police, it's the home office. So basically, when, when they tried to give me this ban, they got the head of the football policing unit come to court, and so did Bedfordshire Police. So Bedfordshire Police Officer, who's my local police force, who know me, all my life, yeah. See, I've always gone and watched Luton since I was 16, yeah. So the local policing unit know who I am, yeah. So they were, they were summoned to court and asked on the dock, they, they had the football policing unit first, which is the home office, the government. And he said, the, the, my barrister just said to him, who's, who's bringing this banning order against our client? And he said, Bedfordshire Police. And she said, okay, so it's not you, it's not the home office, it's Bedfordshire Police. He said, yeah, it's Bedfordshire Police. 
Then when they got the Bevshire police officer up straight after him, he'd gone out, got the officer up and said, um, why, is, why are you bringing this case against our client? And he said, we're not. And then he said, you're not. So who's bringing this case? He said, this has been forced on us. Who's forced it on you? She said, the football policing officer. So the officer had just been on the dock before. And then, and then she said, okay, I'm going to ask you one more question. Is our client a risk? Do you see our client as a risk of attending football? He said, no, not at all. So she kicked the case out, and it, when she kicked it out, she said that this, were, this case was vague, the, the, the evidence was vague, cagey, and dishonest. But the map was what it was about. It was about giving me a perimeter ban wow. so they could control me like they've just done for six months in London to ban me from certain areas. But as I said, yeah, I love football, but I fell out of love with football. I, but I still love Luton, so I'm, I'm Luton mad. And uh, we went up, we've gone down. Uh, you know, December 18th, 2022, do you remember what day that was in soccer history? December 18th, 2022, World Cup final. So I'm a gigantic, I mean, I'm only one of about 8 billion people who is a gigantic Messi fan. And I'm old enough to have seen supposedly all of the greatest players of all time, most of them. What, Uh, Messi or Ronaldo, man, then? Ronaldo can't tie the shoes of Messi. You don't think? Not even remotely. And if if you think otherwise, then you're not really a soccer expert. Uh, <coughs> R- Ronaldo is a, is a guy who has incredible athletic ability, incredible discipline, who's trained to be the beast that he is. He, he's a great goal scorer. Messi is artistry. Messi is, Messi is it's divine, the way he moves. I mean, just ask any soccer players, they almost all will fall on the end to, to Messi. Anyways, when, when the World Cup final came about, one of the things that's beautiful about soccer or any sport, but certainly soccer, is that the fans become as vested in the outcome as the players themselves. As a matter of fact, there are, there are studies that show that the testosterone levels of fans is go, the same, is as, the same as the players. If the, the, if the guys that win, if that's my team, my testosterone goes up. If they lose, my testosterone goes down. Now, I've been a soccer fan you know, my whole life and so on, but the World Cup final, was almost so unbearable to watch that I remember my son said, I'm just, I'm gonna stop watching, I'm gonna have a heart attack. And he was like 11 years old then. And the reason why it was so important, I actually discussed this, I, I appeared after the World Cup final on Joe Rogan's show and I was explaining all this. I didn't ask you about Joe Rogan. Was that? I didn't ask you in our conversation. Oh yeah, that's okay. Rogan, so, I uh, so I said to him, you know, the reason why we were so vested, or at least why I was so vested, is because it would have been a cosmic injustice if he didn't finish if he career, didn't fit with well. winning and i was so vested in him winning that once he won it i truly felt i don't care what it's like sometimes i'm pissed off my my daughter will come up to me and say remember messi won the world cup <laughs> <laughs> i'm like okay life is good again because he represents that cosmic justice like it, it was meant to be for him to win all right but let's now go back to uh maybe more serious issues. Yeah. Uh, you and I chatted eight years ago. Is that the first one? Did we chat? Yeah, yeah, that was 2016, March 2016, I checked. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, we've communicated since, but we haven't had a show uh, together other than the one we did earlier on, on your podcast. Uh, what has changed both personally for Tommy Robinson and in the ecosystem that you fight in? What are some big changes in the past eight years for you? What's changed? Um, I think a lot of the public have awoken to the things we were talking about. So, whereas people didn't take us seriously or didn't want to listen to what we were saying, now now they do. Now they know. We've been proven right in everything we were talking about. All the warnings we were given, all the all the all the problems we were talking about, and why why have we been proven right on it? As I said, I'm from Luton Town. I foresaw all the problems because my town had gone from when I was born in 1982, one mosque, and now it's 45. So wow. Yeah, it's over a 50% Muslim population, Pakistani. So all the things I saw early, as in the, government, the local council's appeasement of them, the two-tier policing. Two-tier policing has become part of British vocabulary now, yeah? yeah. Everyone's talking about it. But I went back when I, we just done our latest documentary. Explain what two-tier policing is. Two-tier are. policing is the way the police fail to deal with one community at all, really. They bend their knees to them or they just don't deal with them or they let them get away with criminality. and They, and they treat that community with kid gloves and then they treat everyone else with iron fists. So rather than deal with the problem, they'll deal with the people who talk about the problem. Yeah. Right. Through cowardice, through fear, through um, political correctness, through all, a, a multitude of all these things coming together. But I went back through my speeches and leaflets and things I've spoke about. The first time I was talking about it was 2004. And that's because I've seen it. I saw the police not deal with the heroin gangs, the grooming gangs, the rape gangs. 
I saw them just let them get away with it and just facilitate their criminality. But then now, what's happened over the last two years, especially since October 7th, with the mass demonstrations of pro-Hamas on the streets calling for the gas of the Jews, literally stand there calling for jihad, literally calling out for jihad, and their words are the Muslim armies, and then we've got the Metropolitan Police come out and say jihad has multiple different meanings. Well, right. when they're talking about Muslim armies, they're not talking about an inner struggle. Yeah? Okay? You are I, I need to lose weight, and it's an inner, inner struggle. struggle. That's what jihad is. Yeah, that's, that's how they... And, and then they're holding up the ISIS flag, yeah. and they're telling us it's not the ISIS flag. Yes, yeah? right. It's not the flag of war, which we know it is. So they're literally gaslighting us, but the whole country then, it's Swella Braverman come out and said it, who at the time was our Home Secretary. She was forced out of the Conservative Party, but sat out of her position for it. So it's become part of the vocabulary that the British public have witnessed all of those things I saw, they've now seen with their own eyes, yeah. certainly in the last 12 months anyway. So that's changed for me, is um, I'm well received. I used to get a lot of punches on the nose. Not so much now, more <laughs> hugs, kisses, <laughs> so it's better. But I think that, um, that's what's changed. And what's changed for me probably, personally, is um, probably 2016, where, where was I 2016? At times I've been in low places over my activism. Bad places, yeah. worrying places, um, dark places. Thinking, what am I going to do? Probably, probably trying to. As a man, you like to de- think you can deal with everything, but my problems, a lot of them, probably come from fear. That fear at times drove me into partying, yeah? And, yeah. and that's how and blacking things out. Probably, I don't now, so I deal with it a lot better. So, how long has it been since you've drank? I had a. It's probably been in the last year once. In okay. the last year, but then, when, but when I used to drink, I didn't drink to enjoy myself. So I probably drank... To escape? Yeah, yeah. So probably to escape reality. Because what is reality? For me, reality is not great. Yeah. Reality at the minute is I go back to... On the 29th of July, I'm in court, probably going back to jail. So reality has always been what's coming next. And, what, and, and essentially, my fear has never been Muslims uh, attacking me. I'm, I'm, I don't fear that in the, in the same sense. My fear is always, what are the state going to do next? Where are they going to leave me or leave my family? Well, that was the, t- the title of your, I think, first book, Enemy of the Enemy State, of the right? State, yeah, yeah. Enemy of the State, because I, I, I knew Muslims would want to kill me um, for talking about certain issues, highlighting certain issues. I knew the dangers of that, but I didn't realise the level, the level the, the state would go to. Do you, do you almost hate the Westerners who grant cover more than the Islamists who might come? Because at I least they're. Respect. Yeah, exactly. I actually respect. <laughs> Yeah. some of the Islamists yeah, yeah, yeah. because they say what they mean yeah? yeah. I think well they're not messing about but then I look at the people who facilitate them and I think well it's you lot and like, you're the letting them do this right. you're bending every time and, and, and then the church even I, I fuck the, the church I went for a the, 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 Tom, Tom Robinson his name was Tom Robinson Bishop the Bishop of Pontefract yeah? so one of the highest ranking in the, in the Church of England called us for a meeting said we need you to come on a meeting yeah your representative of opposition to Islamic communities, we're going to bring you for a meeting with the Grand Mufti, who preaches at the Golden Dome Mosque in, in um, Jerusalem. Yeah? Yeah. So we went for this meeting, and I said, OK. And they, they sat, it was in a church building. It was a secret meeting. We weren't allowed, so it was a secret meeting. So we've gone, all these Muslim leaders come in, and they said, right, we want to fresh it out. Tell us what's wrong. So I said, well, don't need to ask me twice. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what's wrong. I said, you've taken liberties in our country the, the, with girls, with women. with the, And I went through and just listed out, listed out. And then I said to the church, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing to about any of And we're supposed to be your lost flock. Yeah. But you're always on the side against us. You come out condemning us. You, we, we, we're talking about the problems we're dealing with and you're condemning us. And then he said, um, well, at Christmas, this is the church leader, at Christmas, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring communities together. So we had a Christmas do together with the Muslims. I said, oh, right. No wine. That's what I said. Did you have wine? <laughs> Did you have wine? And he went, no. I said, so you had a Sharia compliant Christmas meal. Right. I said, you bend every time. They don't bend. They will not budge on their views of anything, yeah? But you're bending on every one of our principles. And the Muslim fella, afterwards, he said, do you know what, Tommy? Like, I said, what? And he said, do you know how refreshing it's been just to have someone tell us? straight. He said, because we keep going to these diversity meetings and we're having all these photos taken. And I said, Jen, you're pretending there's no problems. Yeah. You're all standing and thinking a picture of a, yeah. a, 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 of a rabbi, a picture of a priest and a picture of an imam is standing together. When they're the wrong people you're trying to bring together. Right. Yeah? Totally wrong. So I think that, again, the debate has shifted, the over and window shifted yeah. in what's acceptable to say right. in discussions. A lot of the people who used to condemn me on the TV or, or commentators who would condemn me are now saying exactly the same as me. 
I had a journalist ring me up who spent a year with me, and he rang me up last year, um, and he said, have you seen what's happened? I said, what? He goes, all the people who are against you are now far more extreme than you in their commentary. I said, I, was, I don't ever see my views have ever, ever have been extreme, but they tried, they had to make us toxic. They had to make us figures of hate to stop the debate. Because the debate, the, or the issues I raise about grooming, about rape, about all these gangs, about any of these problems, whether it be jihad, terrorism, their real problems have come about because of the government's failed, failed policies. And they don't want their policies addressed or looked at. What do you think? I mean, we, we've talked about this uh, earlier, and uh, you and I have weighed in on this, but I think it's worthwhile for my audience to hear about it. Why do you think the Western leaders take the positions that they do when it comes to Islam? Why do I think they take, well, cowardice, okay, yeah, weakness. Okay. Um, it's just the path of least resistance. If I just ignore it, hopefully it somehow goes away. It's the level. How powerful is political greatness? How powerful is it? You know, so, and this is hard to get someone's head around it, that we allowed in our country a generation of English girls to be raped. Due to in, in the thousands? What, what's the final? Do we have a sense of the number? So we, Rotherham, 1,400 children yeah, over a 16 year period were raped. Rotherham has a 3.7% Muslim population, yeah? so that's Rotherham. Telford, I made a five part series on the gang rapes in Telford. Telford, the police identified 1,000 victims. Telford has 1.7% Muslim population. They've identified 1,000 girls, five are dead. Five of those girls are dead, yeah? The police, police investigation identified 200 men. I spent 12 to 18 months in that town getting to know the survivors of these crimes, yeah? And we built a database, like a massive wall, the whole size of this, where we've done an investigation into the men. So I sat down with the girls, and people, you might read statistics about grooming, yeah? And people, I watch as politicians talk about these girls, like their statistics, it's like they're not statistics, they're our daughters, you know? They're, they're a man's child, yeah, that's been raped and tortured, okay, yeah? So, and I, I, as we went through, I sit down with a victim, and I might sit with her three times for four hours, five hours, and then we play it all back, and we literally built a database. And every time the men were named by more than three of the girls, so in the end, on our spreadsheet database, we had 254 names. I knew every address, every business, and every local Muslim man in that town by the end of the investigation. I knew every, every link to them, and they are a mafia. Every one of them's related, every one of them's linked. Some of them are police officers, some of them are CPS solicitors. They're all intertwined, yeah? So the police investigation identified 200. Our investigation identified 254. An independent inquiry identified over 300, yeah? So in that town, there's 3,000 Muslims. Get rid of the women, get rid of the under 16s, get rid of those 70s. There's 1,000 men. So out of a thousand Muslim men in one small town in England, there's a thousand victims and five are dead. Yeah? And the police have identified 20% of the men involved in that rape. Up to, so 20 to 30%, we're not talking about a handful of men here, 20 to 30%, the police investigation prosecuted 11. So they left 180, 189. They didn't prosecute 189. Wow. In fact, we, we ended up in our investigation, which the media never comment on, we ended up finding corrupt police officers who were working for the gangs to receive money. We've got eyewitnesses seeing them take money. So we've done a five-part five part series where we each, each episode is about telling the story of another girl. It's, it's fascinating. Where, where can people uh, see You this? get on Rumble under Tommy Robinson official called The Rape of Britain. And when I say this, I, I, don't, I, I haven't... When I went into telling these stories, I don't think I... I hadn't prepared myself for the damage, the damaged girls. I went in as an investigative journalist to tell these stories and then got to know the families and the victims and then never thought these girls were putting their faces up on camera. Like one girl, one story. I went online and I saw, as we were doing this investigation, a girl had gone on Facebook and said one of the grooming, one of the grooming gang members was getting out of jail for the rapes in that town, Telford. And she said, how has no one killed them yet? Where are the English men? Yeah? She said, do you know what? I'm going to end this. This was the comment she's paid. So I prayed to a private investigator. I said, find her. Yeah? We found, we tracked her down to a hostel in London. So I knocked on the door of the hostel. And I, I always, I record everything in these circumstances. I don't want anyone saying I've said anything I haven't. So even if I don't use the footage, I, I, I'll record yeah. it. So I knocked on the door and some black lad answered and said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here looking for, name the girl. He said, all right, two minutes. She's come out. What the fuck are you doing here? I said, can I have an hour of your time? Let me talk to you for an hour. And then she didn't like me. She, she was a li her parents, she, her parents were- she, she knew of you? She know, knew of me, yeah, okay. of course. She, she knew of me, but she, so she got in the car and we were probably in the car for two, three hours. And I went through all the stuff with her about her life. 
And I said, look, I'm, I saw the comment you made about killing people. Yeah? I said, I'm just here, look, I'm going to take these gangs down. Yeah? These men, I, I, I watch as these girls are suffering 10 years, 20 years later, as they're suicidal, as they're hooked on drugs. Do you know the gang members? They're all driving Ferraris, uh, sports cars, living in big houses, profitable businesses. Yeah? They've destroyed these girls and they've profited all the way up to the top. They're like a mafia in criminality and everything. They're untouchable. They, they, view, they view themselves as untouchable. So our, our purpose of the films was only once we have three girls that don't know each other, name the same man with the same accusations, I, the purpose of the documentary is to make the man famous. We went into their businesses. I walked into their businesses in the middle of their businesses wow. and said, uh, and we found men that have raped, uh, that murdered young girls, running, running businesses, no one even knows. When I walked in the restaurant, I said, how many people know he killed a 12-year-old girl? How many of these customers in here? And they were just like, I said, what? And then I said, I put the accusations to them. But with this girl, this girl who I met, I said, right, help me, right, help me bring them down. Help me take these gangs down. And she took my number. And then about a week later, I'm up, and we're in a house in the north of England and we've got all the images. Like we've done, we've done an amazing investigation to these groups. Yeah? We put trackers on their cars, cameras on their houses. So we had evidence, like we followed them everywhere. We had, we had surveillance vans, you can see it on the documentary. So we're, wow. zoom, we're zooming in on them. Yeah? It was the best work I've ever done, but then also the most, they blew my car up, they petrol bombed my car, they went to my mother's house. The gangs did, yeah? They, they, they attacked, you see it on the documentaries, they blew everything up. They blew houses up across Telford, and the police are saying these bombings are not connected. They were attacking any survivor, because they didn't know who was talking to me, but they knew I put a trailer out with all their images on the wall saying, we're coming for you, right. yeah? And they're thinking, who's talking to them? So then they just started attacking at any of the girls that they'd raped and their houses. But this girl, I'll, I'll get a phone call, and um, just now I'll get a message saying, Tommy, you've got 20 minutes. Any questions you want to ask, you've got 20 minutes to ask them. So, and, and this is all in the documentary. So I ring the girl, I say, you're right, what are you talking about? And we're, and we're recording it. And she says, uh, I'm ending it. And I said, what do you mean you're ending it? She said, I'm in Telford. Now London's a three hour drive from Telford. So I think, she's gone to kill it. Yeah? I said, where are you in Telford? She said, I'm parked outside his house. And I'm like, no, like, I said like, oh, in, in my own selfish thing, I'm thinking the last person she's gonna ring before she kills this Muslim is me. Yeah? And then, she, and then I say, what are you doing? And she, I said, look, where, how far are your mum and dad? Where do your mum and dad live? And then she just breaks down. And she breaks down, she said, I've been dead, Tommy, for 15 years. Every time she gets a new sexual partner, she has flashbacks of all the men raping her. She said, she can't get on with her life. She said, oh, it's wow. rape is torture. I've been tortured for eternity. And then she's crying, screaming. And then I'm, and I'm like, don't, don't. And she goes, I'm not gonna kill him. I'm killing myself. I'm ending it now. I'm ending it now. And the, the moment that changed her, I, I said, uh, I the moment that changed the whole conversation, I said, I've just had a shit curry. I don't know how I got on the conversation. She said, what do you mean you've had a shit curry? She said, did you make it or order it? I said, I ordered it. She said, you need to make it. She said, you need to make it. I said, please come up here and make me a curry. <laughs> Get away from that house, wherever you are, I'll send the car to pick you up, and, then, and she come. Yeah? But with the, and each one of these films tells a different girl's story. It, it's a, and then, but the gangs, when we went after the gangs, one of the main rapists is in the mosque preaching against the grooming gangs. Yeah? They are all, and then we've got a picture, it's, it's unbelievable, yeah? We've got a picture outside the mosque, you know, these diversity photos. Of course. Right? All the police officers. So the police officer, officer whose job it is, is, is his job to tackle the grooming gangs, is stood next to the main grooming gang leader, yeah? And he probably knows that. Well, their intelligence yeah, 100% yeah, yeah, knows yeah, yeah. it. They're all in criminal gangs. They're all working together. So the police force is working, and we've done a five-part series. We've got one more, one more um, episode to do. But as I said, I wasn't, I wasn't ready. I, I put a lot of heat and discussion in talking about gangs, about Islam. But I've never made it personal. But on the, when I, this gang was called the Banalis, that's their name. Obviously, when I started coming for them, and it was a five-part series, so none of them knew who was coming. But do you have the board game Guess Who in America? I think so, yeah. You know where you have to guess things about people and you have the silhouette of the faces. So we'd end episode two on a silhouette with like five or six of their faces <laughs> and then it'd just have question marks, tick tock, tick tock, who's next? Yeah. Right. And, and it was great because I was thinking, yeah, we're, we're putting it on these gangs because they're not getting prosecuted. And if they're not going to get prosecuted, we're going to make sure everyone knows who you are. You're going to become famous to the whole of Britain and famous to your town as child rapists. But we hired, it, it was great work. As I said, it, it was, we hired a house. Um, one of the rapists, we rented that, he was a gas engineer. So we rented the house, and then we got a girl to ring up and get him to come and fix the boiler. And as he comes to fix the boiler, what, we come walking in. I said, hello mate, you didn't expect to see us here, did you? <laughs> but it was, it was great in the sense of showing the public and understanding 
that 10 years after these girls being raped, they're suicidal still. Yeah. Their lives are destroyed. They're living every day with these, the pain and the men. And this is just one town, so people understand how big the problem is. This is just one town, and I got onto that from talking about political correctness. The police force in Telford, the police force in Rotherham. You know in Rotherham, there was a, obviously we spoke about this from 2009. In 2014, a government report came out called the, J, the Alexis J report in Rotherham. So it wasn't Tommy Robinson saying this, it was a government official report. Two girls, 13 years old, they're in a house being raped by lots of Muslim men. The two dads get together, they go around the house to get their daughters back, so they're kicking off at the house. Please turn up with the dads. Oh, I've, I think I've heard of that story, yeah, yeah. Left the girls in the house. There was, a, there was another 12 year old girl in a house, um, in a derelict house with five Muslim men abusing her. The police come to the derelict house, they meet the girl. They nicked her for being drunk and disorderly. They let the men go, oh. literally, they, like, these things sound unbelievable, yeah? This isn't just in one town. This has been 65 cities in the UK where these gangs are in every city that has a Muslim community. And, and I said it, I mean, we're in Canada. If you've got large Muslim communities in Toronto, okay, in, in the city here, those, these gangs are operating. There's not one single city in the UK that they've not been operating. And it's the same MO, and it's the same crimes, and no one knew what was going on for first. We knew, because we were living in the town. It happened to my cousin, yeah? She was 14 years old. Oh, yeah. So we knew, but it was covered up and hid by the police and the government for 30 years. So the same way they're probably hiding it here. Is it now open? It's now open. Uh, originally, it's called groom they call it grooming, which is another word for rape jihad. They call it grooming, um, they give it a pretty name, and they've arrested handfuls of them in each town, yeah? But it's in every town and city. Do you, it, what do you, if someone were to come to you and say, but why are you putting a Islamic twist to this? There are bad men everywhere, and isn't this just a problem of sexual violence? Why do you link it to Islam? What would you say to that? So I, again, you weren't allowed to ask this question. That's why they hated me, yeah? Because I, I was looking at the numbers, 90% of the convictions, Muslim men make up two and a half percent of the UK population, yeah? Two and a half percent. They are responsible for 90% of the convictions in these gangs. Why? 30% of the men convicted are called Mohammed. Why? Why aren't the Sikhs doing it? Why aren't the Jews doing it? And why aren't the Hindus doing it? Why is it specifically Muslim men? So then I went through and I've done a presentation, the sad state of affairs, it, this work will come about in my, when I was most censored. So this is the best work I've done right. over the most important issue ever. In our, this is the darkest stain in British history, the biggest stain on our history ever. Yeah? A generation of our daughters have been allowed to be raped and the government, the government and police and every institution whose job it was to protect those girls failed them and let them be raped because they were young white girls and the men were Muslim immigrants. And they allowed it. So what I looked at the cases and I went through the cases in and took the testimonies of the victims and what the men said in court. So in, in the Bristol case, it was Somalians in Bristol, and looked at the demographics, because it's not just people said, oh, it's a Pakistani cultural problem. No, there's Afghanis, there's Iraqis, yeah, there's Kurds, there's Somalis, yeah. Okay, the majority are Pakistani, because the majority of Muslims in the UK are Pakistani, yeah. And in England it's called grooming, in India it's called love jihad. In Holland, it's called Lover Boys. You know what I call it? Yeah. Undocumented lovemaking. Undocumented. <laughs> it's, it's just, and, but the, the, the cases and the numbers speak for themselves. And why, why do I say it's Islamic? Because the Somalian in the Bristol case said it was his religious duty to do. Yeah, exactly. They literally quote the Quran yeah. whilst raping the girls. Yeah. And do you know, you've, you've all heard of hate crimes now, yeah? None of these men have been charged under hate legislation. These are the most, these are the only real. People are getting charged with the hate legislation for saying something homophobic online or talking, saying a racial slur against a footballer and they get their door kicked off yeah, for a comment on Facebook. But these men are raping young white girls, calling them dirty white gula, yeah, dirty white slags in their language. Every girl gives it as a testimony, as a witness to the police, and none of them are prosecuted under hate, hate legislation. So the hate crime statistics, literally the hate legislation is brought into literally protect minority groups and that's it right. from any sort of criticism. Is there a statute of limitation in terms of when you can go after these guys or do you think they'll ever go after all of them or? No, so a lot of these are historic cases. So a lot of the girls are going forward and they're historic cases, but that's only, they only started prosecuting them after the formation of the English Defence League in 2009. Right. So if you look, we've done a, I've done a graph from a presentation because have you heard of Andrew Norfolk? He's, a, time, so, he's a Times reporter and he's won all the awards for highlighting this issue. Now, he highlighted it in 2014. In his own words, in an interview, he says he, was, he knew this was going on for years. So he's a coward, yeah? and he's a traitor to the, to the victims. He knew it was going on for years, but then he saw the emergence of the far right, the English Defence League. 
which wasn't far right at all, he saw the emergence of angry English fathers and brothers who were taken to the streets, desperate about what was happening to their daughters. So then he knew he had to take it back. So he's taken some moral high ground. He's got to bring the debate back to the mainstream. So then he wrote about it. Yeah? So he was, we forced him to write about it, which is great. Okay, you can take, you can take the credit. We forced him to report on it. And since then, it's become public knowledge. I remember sitting on TV shows in 2010, saying to Jerry Paxman, who's one of the most renowned BBC. Sure. Now, none of the interviews have aged well for them. I sat there saying, our daughter's been raped in every town and city. These men are kidnapping our kids. And he said, do you expect us to believe that they're being allowed to do this? I was like, yeah, I do. And they I, are. I recognize that smugness. Yeah, he had a total smugness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they all did. They yeah, all did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all did with any of the issues we were trying to raise. But as I said, a lot of these issues that we raised that people didn't want to listen to or they didn't believe, they've come into fruition and they're fact, and now people see it. So what, on July 29th, you might be sent to prison? Tell, tell us about that. So on July, so there was a news story, this is an insane story, yeah? There was a news story, and a young Syrian refugee at school, who was 15, child, another white child, holds him down and pours a bottle of water over his face, yeah? The headline was Syrian refugee attacked they waterboarded in racial attack. Waterboarded. What a fuck. They said it was waterboarded, yeah? That's okay. a headline ever. But this news story, I remember watching it develop, and it wasn't a nice video. When you watch the video, I thought, you little bastard, to the, about the white English boy. I thought it's bang out of order, holding him down and doing that. But you give him no context to what's happened, yeah? And the Syrian refugee has an arm in plaster at the same time. He's broken up, yeah? So then we were told that he's been a victim of racial bullying since he went to this school. Everyone's a racist, he's a victim. This was on CNN News, it was on ABC in America, it was on Israeli news, it went worldwide, yeah? As it was blowing up, everyone who's anyone, from celebrities to boxers, Lennox Lewis, ex-world champions, um, Piers Morgan, Jeremy Vine, all the biggest commentators were outraged and demanding action for this Syrian refugee, yeah? And our Home Secretary, Saji Javid, invited this Syrian refugee to Parliament. Now, within 24 to 48 hours, £180,000 had been raised for the Syrian refugee. In that same time, mothers from the school had contacted me saying he beat my daughter up, sending me pictures of her daughter with a bite mark on the face. Then another girl contacted saying he beat me up with a hockey stick. Then another girl contacted. So I made a video saying, well, you're not really giving, being given the full picture here. Yeah? Stop donating your money, right? There's a lot more to this story. He ain't innocent, right? He attacked girls. He got, got his comeuppance at school. That's what's happened here, yeah? Celebrity Muslim lawyers from the UK, uh, ex-members, one of them, we show it in the documentary, one of them is an ex-member of a terrorist organisation. Yeah? He's now a celebrity ja a lawyer who represents every jihadi in the UK. They started legal proceedings against me saying that I defamed him. Yeah? So they started legal proceedings, they took me to the high court. And sorry, the, the benchmark of defamation is lesser in Britain than it is here, right? So it, defamation, it has to be probable. So I, what I said is, I said I make the accusation that he threatened to stab someone, and I said he attacks girls. Yeah? They said that's defamation. So I had to prove that. So the fact that I was told it, so the first hearing in court, I said, I'm a journalist. I can show you that I was proved. I got all the messages that mum sent me. I'm a journalist, I reported what I was told. Yeah? They didn't give me that recognition as a journalist, so I had to prove it as truth. So I said, okay, I'll prove it as truth. So then they set the court date for a trial. Now, what, one thing I sat and as I watched it, I thought, how come those, I know what that boy was like, because I spoke to everyone in the school. How come one of the school teachers have spoke up for the English boy? Right. Now the English boy, so you know the story, when this blew up, I travelled up there to interview the English boy. I walked into a hotel and his mum was sat there with her two little, he had two mixed race little sisters. They were about nine, yeah? And it was two weeks before Christmas and the mum was crying her eyes out and said, I've spent all my Christmas money on the hotel because Muslims come to the house to attack them, yeah? There was threats to murder them, rape them, gangs were outside the house. So I said, well, where are you going to go? Like, she said, we've got nowhere to go, yeah? This is four hours from where I live. So I said, right, I'll come and pick you up tomorrow, yeah? So I'll bring a van, come and stay with me, yeah? Until we get this sorted. So we drove up there, brought the two sisters down, brought the boy down, yeah? He ended up with me for three years, the kid. He was 15. The boy was 15, yeah? He had the world on his shoulders. This was two weeks before Christmas. So on Christmas Eve, he barricaded himself in and tried to kill himself. The wow. Kid. But because the whole country was told he was a racist, yeah? So I wore a hidden camera. And I thought, I'm going to go up to the, the teacher's houses. So I knocked at the first teacher's house, who's an Asian teacher. I said, and he goes, Tommy. I said, mate, you know, they're prosecuting me. Yeah? He goes, uh, he goes, look, I'm sorry. I said, what? He goes, I took the money. Mm. I said, what do you mean you took the money? He said, they paid us. I said, who paid you? And this is all on camera. Kirkley's Council. So I looked up, Kirk, on the documentary, we look up Kirkley's Council. 
The head of Kirkby's council is Shabir Pandor, yeah? a Muslim. His brother is an, and there were protests outside the school of this Syrian refugee by large groups of Muslims led by Mufti Pandor, the leader of the council's brother. Yeah? He's the same one who organised the rally. Do you remember the school teacher in Northern School who's sp- done the cartoon of Muhammad? Yes. He's still in hiding now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This Mufti Pandor organised all those protests. Yeah? So we started piecing it together saying, so Shabir Pandor is his brother. At this time, you spoke about the Huddersfield Groom Gang. This right. was in Huddersfield. The biggest news story in the country was the Huddersfield Groom Gang. Overnight, it disappeared to be the biggest story in the country was about this poor Syrian refugee. Right. Yeah? They flipped the narrative totally. So the, the, the Asian teacher says, I took the money, Tommy, and I say, okay, what was Jamal like? He said he was a horrible little bastard. This is the Syrian refugee. He come to isolation. You know what I job I do? I said, what do you do? He goes, I work in the isolation unit. He come to attack a girl in there. Yeah? So it's all on camera. So okay. And then, and then he, and he goes, but I can't talk about it. I said, how much do they pay you? He said, 18,000 pounds. He won't anything to do with it. So now I went to the head teacher's house. And I said, look, do you know why I'm here? He said, oh, Tommy, you're never gonna get the truth out there. I said, okay. He goes, why not? He said, no one's allowed to talk about it. And they shut the school. So the head teacher tells me what happened. So when this, when this blew up, he says, Dave, and it, what, he said, they spoke about this at the United Nations meeting, yeah? at the UN meeting. They come up, so when this is blowing up, this is world news story, they then think, okay, get rid of it. Get rid of, get rid of any opposition to it, yeah? So they, they silence everyone. They go up to the head teacher and they blackmail him with his pension. And they sat him in the office and made him sign a non-disclosure agreement. At which point they escorted him off the school property. His part of his non-disclosure agreement, he's not allowed to have a conversation with any other teachers, yeah? He said, Tommy, I haven't worked a day since. I haven't worked wow. a day since. They closed the school. He goes, I got into education to help poor children. I haven't, look what they've done, yeah? And then I said, he had a broken arm. The, senior, the, we, the whole country was told that he had a broken arm from a racist attack. The head teacher said, do you know how he broke his arm? And I did, but I said, how did he break his arm? He goes, he was attacking a boy four years <laughs> younger than him. That's how he broke his arm. And then he said, Tommy, we, the governor, knows high-ranking journalists. We went to journalists to tell them the truth. They wouldn't print it. They wouldn't print it. Amazing. So I've got seven teachers on covert recordings. Yeah? So you're, this is the film that's coming out this end is, of July? And like this is a film that I made, and then when I went to court, they took me to court, they bankrupt me on this case for 1.6 million. Yeah? I went before no jury, a judge. So when I went to court and they said I defamed him, I got the school records, I got everything. Yeah? I said he friend stabbed someone. In the school records, he gets caught with a knife and screwdriver at school, and the words, he stabbed another pupil, and the word stabbed is by the teacher. Yeah? So I think, well, I can't be defamed him if he's running around stabbing people. Yeah? So I produce all this in court, seven teachers, five pupils come to court. One of the pupils is a grade A student. In court, we read out her school record. She's the only pupil in her year to have zero negatives. She got 11 A grades, top grades, and what are you doing now, darling, now that you've left school? I'm studying the law. So why are you here today as a witness? Because the truth matters. So what is the truth? Hit that boy there, attack me with a hockey stick. I'm still suffering now from the damages from it. Then another boy gets up and gives testing me, who witnessed him do that, yeah? But when the Syrian refugee, no one comes to court for the Syrian refugee, just him, yeah? Five pupils come against him. One he spat at and slapped a girl. One he attacked with a hockey stick. Another boy witnessed it. Another boy pulled his mum with white slag and attacked him. So these children come and testified. When it got to Jamal, the, the Syrian boy giving evidence, the media were reporting how terrified he was and how bad I was. When it got to the witnesses getting up to give our thing, all the media walked out of court. And I said to the judge, hold on a minute, yeah? So none of this is getting reported. So all the witnesses are getting up giving their evidence. Then the judge, so I produce all this evidence thinking you've got no case, yeah? And the, the, le- the lengths they went to of manipulation, the video that went viral online actually happened six weeks before. The, sli- the solicitor's firm put in a, a freedom of information request on the Syrian's family to make sure it was clean. The, the results come back on the 25th. On the 26th, this is world news. They literally planned it. Yeah? Wow. They literally planned it. So I produce all the covert recordings to the judge, say there's the truth, the whole thing's a lie, everyone was paid. I put in a freedom of information request to find out how much the council spent on buying the silence of their, their employees. £275,000. And then they, so they were telling the whole country I lied. Yeah? And one mother, the mother who, who, who had a bite mark, their whole case rested on the fact that she put out a statement saying what she said wasn't true. I went and knocked on her door in Canberra and just said, look, what, what's going on? She goes, Tommy, they're threatening to rape us. Wow. All on camera. And it's all on the documentary. So I said, okay, so did he attack your daughter? She said, yes, but we've got to live here, Tommy. 
Yeah, my daughter's got to walk these streets. I said, I get it. Don't worry. I go, don't, don't, don't worry. All right. But I've got it in the recordings. So I put it to the judge, saying, it's all true. Yeah. The judge listed everything that he saw on the covert recordings. He then ruled against me and gave me an injunction saying, if any of this footage or any of the school records are ever released, released you get two years in jail. Oh, so that so the fact that if you you've released I this, I have released it. I've never oh, released it. But someone they, did. In someone America, did. Therefore, you can go to jail. Therefore, I'm in what, breach. What, when when will that decision be made? Court, I go to court on the 29th of July. Now, if you look at the timing of it, the film was released 18 months ago. The court case was four years ago. Yeah, I've never released. It. If I, it's never gone out on any of my social media. It was leaked in America. Now, and it hasn't had that many views. Yeah, by bringing me to court and putting me in jail, which is their plan. I guess it's going to bring a lot of attention to the film. Yeah. If you watch the film, there's no grey area. I, I, as a journalist, reported the truth. I'd done an investigation and I told the public the truth. They're not happy that the public got the truth because what the truth was that the Syrian refugee was one of 20,000 that the Conservative government brought in at the height of the ISIS war when no one wanted Syrian refugees into our country. One of them has been causing mayhem. Just what, what are the other 19,999 up to? Yeah? <laughs> but you've changed the whole story to the entire country and you've made it the, and and the collateral damage in this was the english kids who tried to kill himself who never had a life from that point on who ended up living with me his sisters were out of education for six months they had nowhere to live the school none of the school teachers have worked again they closed the school the entire school got shut down right. over this wow so that's the story so i'm in court on the 29th of july i faced two years in prison so the the film which the public you, you probably will have a lot of uh, Muslim friends in prison, no? Of course, yeah, I'm, I'm a well popular in there. <laughs> but the, no, they'll put me on solitary confinement, which is what they done last time. So right. I'll, I'll have a year of solitary confinement. Right. And I said, like, I'm good company, but I'm not that good company. After I get on my own for a while, it'll be... But they know that. They right. know the purpose of that, which is mental, mental abuse, mental torture. But for a film, so in 2024, I'm a journalist in Great Britain. I made a documentary. The public have seen it, some of them. And you're going to lock me off two years. But the, the thing is, because, they, because of the media, all they'll say is I lied, A, because they said that last time, which I didn't, and I broke uh, a legal injunction, which the legal injunction is to prevent the public seeing their lies and their corruption. The whole story is, when you see it all put together in the documentary, it's like, it's in, and do you know what? You know, we talked about earlier about Elon Musk. Elon Musk talked about citizen journalism and how important it is to citizen journalism. I'm not just saying it because this is my work, yeah? This is the best piece of citizen journalism investigation anyone's ever going to watch. It totally, from start to finish, highlights and embarrasses and humiliates and gets the entire process of the unholy alliance of the media, the council, far left organisations, Muslim extremist organisations, and the judiciary, all cooperating together in order to control wow. the narrative. And the narrative, the narrative was open border immigration and English racist bads, English white racists. All right, a couple of uh, personal questions. Yep. So in, in the sad truth about happiness, in my, in my latest book, I talk about wh you know, wh what are some roads to happiness that could come through your work. And I argue, not surprisingly, that anything that gives you purpose and meaning is all other things considered going to make you happy, right? So if you, for example, create things, you're a chef, you're an architect, you're an author, because you're creating, it gives you purpose and meaning. Now, someone like in your case, who is obviously doing stuff that is really important civilizationally, is going to have that sense of purpose and meaning. Could you have ever imagined having a career other than what kind of the, tra the trajectory that you've taken that would have given you as much purpose, purpose. and meaning? Do you know what, Joe? Like, so when this film got leaked, it was probably 18 months ago, and I was on the way to America. Hmm. So it got leaked 18 months ago, and uh, as soon as it got leaked, I thought, they're going to lock me up. I know they're going to lock me up. So I, I thought, I started making a documentary. I thought, I'm going to see how easy it is to get in the United States. Yeah? And it, it cost $10,000 from the Bahamas. Okay? So, and it's all Irish. The Irish were going into America on boats, white Irish, mm -hmm. yeah, travellers. So I looked at this and I went out there. And then I didn't come home for six months. And I was lost in purpose and meaning. Yeah? Whenever I've stopped, whenever I, and, and sometimes I thought, I've had enough, I'm tired. Yeah? So I've gone to stop my work. And I've lost purpose and meaning. And then when I throw myself back in like I have for the last six months, I've never been so focused and driven in my life. Because right. yeah? I've got my purpose and meaning, I've got my cause, I've got my focus, I know what I'm doing, I don't know where it's taking me, but I know why I'm doing it. And for, for, for I, get a massive, I get a massive buzz off of, probably why censorship was so difficult to deal with, I get a buzz off of, if you, I, I gave a speech at Oxford University, the Oxford Union, when I walked in there everyone hated me. 
Yep. I was getting booed, I was getting shouted at. I had an hour and 15 minute presentation when I walked out, everyone was taking selfies. Yeah? Because, and I got a buzz, if you look at the comments, they said, I thought this bloke was a, a thug, I thought he was a Nazi, I thought he was brain dead. I can't believe I've been lied to. Yeah? So I get a buzz off of challenging people's opinions and changing their minds and making them open their eyes to the problems that I've seen. Yeah. So that's my buzz. So censorship took that buzz away. Censorship made me talking in a little echo chamber to myself and it, it took away my drive yeah. and, my, and everything. So, so yeah, I think my, my purpose and meaning certainly is, is like I have, I have been a man on a mission for 12 years. At times I got tired and took a break. So now I deal with it by going mad for two weeks and then I go to a fitness camps for a week <laughs> on my own or go for walks for a week. How does your family, I mean, they, they were catapulted into this life of yours without it being their choosing. <laughs> Are they currently happy that you've taken this path or do they say, can you just keep your big mouth shut? And no, no, the kids have, been, there's been a massive shift, yeah? So my kids have got to see that. My, my kids get to see the love I have people show me. Yeah. Whether I be in the car, when I'm out in the streets with them, people coming up, taking photos. So my kids get to see the positivity. They've seen negativity. They've seen me violently attacked. They've seen, I've been violently attacked multiple times in front of my family. Um, they've seen that, but they also know why I do what I do. That I, I've had these conversations. So I think now when my children come to the last rally on June the 1st, we had 30,000 in London. It's the first event my family ever You have another one coming up soon. 27th of July, two days before my court case. This is the reason they've thrown this case at me. Right. This is why at the right. time, they've held it for 18, it was 18 months ago, and then bang, you're in court. You're in court because they're worried because there seems to be a mass awakening. People, the, the, people are unifying. We held an event where there was members of every different British community or minority group that had come together to just say, look, we've had enough of this. Right. We've had enough of this, yeah. We've, we've been silent, silent about it for too long. Um, the public have come together, but my kids, are, my kids are thankfully, and I've been through bad times and facing it again now. But I think my kids have grown up to um, to see the reason I do it because I kept it all shielded from when I, when they were younger. Right. And they've had a difficult time. All right. Other two more questions. Uh, although, of course, I could keep you here for another four hours, <laughs> but but my wife is picking me up shortly, so we have to end it soon. Uh, so, in the last one of the last chapters of the happiness book, I talk about regret. And here I want to set it up for you and then ask you the question. So one of my former uh, professors when I was doing my PhD, his name is Thomas Gilovich. He studied the psychology of regret and he argued, he, he wasn't the first one to argue this, but that there are two sources of regret. There is regret due to inaction or regret due to action. So regret due to inaction, I regret that I never became an artist and became an accountant because my dad was an accountant. So I, I regret that I didn't pursue what I wanted to pursue. Regret due to action would be, I regret that I cheated on my wife and because of that action that led to, the, to my divorce. Okay? Well, if you ask people over the long term to look back at their life in terms of what has been the most looming regret in their life, usually it ends up being a regret due to inaction, the road not taken. So if I ask you, you're still a young man, but if I were to ask you today, looking back, what is your singular or maybe couple of greatest sources of regret? Would you be willing to share some of those? Not playing the film. So when the judge gave me the injunction, and it had me, it's had me up ever since. So I, I've, if, you, if, you, if you worry about consequence, you're never going to bring about change. Yeah? So I've never worried about the consequence. I thought, I'll deal with the consequence when it happens. And that's from the start of activism. What are we doing? We're doing this. Why are we doing it? It's right. Who cares what else happens? People want to kill you. At prison, we had a saying with the English Defence League, death, prison or glory, we shall not stop it. Yeah? That's what we said, we're going to live by this rule. Right? It does it and we're not stopping. And it got us all that way. And for the first time, probably because I've done multiple stints of solitary confinement and been in a bad place from them, when the judge gave me that injunction, my regret is not walking out of court and playing that film straight away and saying, stuff your injunction. Yeah? Your injunction, I, I don't recognise your injunction. Because your injunction is prohibiting the freedom of the press, it's prohibiting the freedom of speech, it's prohibiting the public. You're, you're, you're censoring the public from seeing the reality of what this lie is about. And I didn't do that. I didn't do that. And the reason I didn't do it is because I worried about the consequence. I worried about the consequence and the effect it would have on my kids because I'd seen the effect it had each time I went to jail. I worried about my boy, I worried about all those different things. And that's why I didn't do it. And I, I think like I failed at that time for, the, for a year. I was, I, it ate me up for I failed myself and I failed my cause because I should have done it instantly. And I still regret it now. And I still regret it. And it's like I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in a thing where if you, if you think you're going to take me to court on the 29th of July and you're going to put me in prison without me, well, with me going quietly, you're wrong. Yeah? Right. The world will see that film. If you bring me to jail 
the world's going to see the film. I'm not going to go quietly on the issue. And, if, and essentially, it's the only safety mechanism I have is enough of the public get to see that film. Because if the public see the film, they know that all I've done was report the truth. All I've done was give the public the truth, which is what they don't want them having. I challenge the government narrative, and that's why they're punishing me for it. So that's my regret. Um, that, that's a regret that's really ate me up. I should have done it. All the other mistakes I've made, which I've made lots, been in stupid, done stupid things at different times. Um, I think you learn. I think that every mistake you make changes right. the character you become. I, I don't regret them mistakes. I, I don't regret learning from them. One regret I'd have is drinking, partying. <laughs> Uh, because if, I, if I'd have been focused, I, I look at essentially some of the stuff I've done or work I've done and think, I look back and think, geez, I weren't in a good place for years there. And what could I have done if I was straight headed, clean, right. fit, physically fit? The one thing I'd have, I'd, my regret is being a mess or a laziness. Instead, of, I, I now have to get in a, I, I, like you said earlier, you walk every day, I have to train every day. I, if, if I go three or four days on training, my life can, can I share your walk yesterday when you came to see me? Yeah, yeah. So for those of you who don't know, I'm going to look at the camera, yeah. that where we are today is about a two-hour walk from where we ended up meeting. So I asked Tommy, where did, how did you get here? He said, oh, I walked, mate. I'm like, <laughs> two hours? So he walked there and walked back. So that was about four hours. That was yeah, impressive. I mean, but I enjoy it. <laughs> I enjoy it now. But I, I, I essentially need to do that. I, I need to, for my own thing, is just train. I need to get up and do. And, and even if I'm tired, I still do this. I need routine. I'm a creature of habit. Right. I need routine. Beautiful. I need routine to have stability. So. All right. So tell us, where can people find you? Anything you um, want to promote, take it away. On July 29th, HMP Belmarsh. <laughs> no, you can find me on, uh, on Twitter, thanks to Elon Musk. At at uh, at T Robinson New Era. 